Food writer and food fan Jack Bishop believes there really is a single best way to make a dish, be it mac and cheese or Chinese barbecued pork. Bishop has some bulletproof ways to tur turn you into a fine chef. He's the executive editor of Cook's Illustrated Cookbook, editor of America's Test Kitchen, and it is my pleasure to welcome Jack Bishop to Studio 4 to tell us more. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You also have something to do with that magazine. Yes, Cook's Illustrated. Mm -hmm. It's our 20th anniversary. Really? Yes, tw and 20 years, no advertising. That's the funny part. No advertising, not a lot of glitz and glamour, just great information about how to make great food. It is. It's really all about cooking. I mean, I think a lot of food magazines sort of begin with food, but then go to all of the lifestyle mm -hmm. things that surround mm -hmm. it, restaurants, tabletop, travel. We're about cooking, and we are all about people who are in the kitchen, using their hands, using their equipment, and creating their own food. So that uh, you can take something to America's Test Kitchen and test it to see if indeed it is the best mac and cheese going. Oh, well, our recipe development process begins by testing lots of different recipes. So we'll get a folder with 400, 500 recipes, and mm -hmm. we'll start testing recipes to get a sense of what the pitfalls are, what are the good things in some of these recipes, what are the things that are not working, and we'll probably spend six to eight weeks testing that recipe, making it 50, 100, 125 times in order to come up with a recipe that we think is the absolute best version. And who does all the tasting? I do. You do. That's well, part of the job. You're not very plump for being a taster. Um, I will thank my parents and my genetics for okay, that. Okay, fine. Were they cooks? Did you come from a foodie family? My grandmother was a great cook. Mm. Um, I like to say the fact that my mother was not much of a good cook was enabled me in my career. Uh, I as, see. Uh, as the eldest of three children, mm. uh, I took charge. Uh, I got it. You got mm -hmm. that picture? So you, roast beef at your house was really well done, was it? It was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, but uh, not so more. Uh, now it's perfectly done. Yes. And what's the secret to that? So you can take a cheap cut, salt it for 24 hours in the refrigerator, and then cook it at a very low oven temperature. And what you're doing is you are tenderizing that meat. There are mm. natural enzymes in the meat that are killed once the meat gets too hot. So what you're trying to do is keep it just below the point where it's done in a range between 110 and 120 degrees, and you even turn off the oven for the last half hour of cooking in order to get a super tender roast from a cheap cut. Not only that, if you want it medium rare or rare, it's all the way through, not just a little red spot in the middle. Yeah, a hot oven, you end up with big disparities, and mm -hmm. the center is sort of not cooked, and the outside is overcooked. In a very cool oven, uh, we're using 225 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is, you know, basically as right. low as your oven will go, mm -hmm. you are getting even cooking from edge to center. Uh, the salt thing. Yeah. Uh, everybody has a theory about when to salt, when not to salt, but you say when it comes to a not too expensive cut of roast beef, if you salt it 24 hours ahead and then cook, better way to go. Yeah, there are two things that are happening. So first of all, the seasoning is getting deeper into the meat. And so you've mm. got a huge cut of meat. It might be four or five pound roast. If you just sprinkle some salt on it and throw it in the oven, the salt is not gonna get to the center of the roast uh, very quickly. So better seasoning, but also right. that, that salt, when it gets in there, it changes the protein structure of the meat so that when the meat is heated up, it's able to hold mm -hmm. on to its natural juices. And so you end up with less moisture being lost during the cooking process because you've salted the roast in advance. And would that work with lamb, other meats, doesn't matter? It will work with uh, pork, lamb, beef. Cheap cuts, expensive cuts. Uh, there is a single best way to cook a dish, according to you and all the people you work with. There is. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you get into the TV thing? Um, we said, you know, we should try to do a TV show. And uh, everyone we talked to. Why not? To, why not? <laughs> That's what everyone does. And we're all mm -hmm. magazine editors. So we began by saying, we're rather than putting a single personality on air, we were going to try to capture that ensemble nature mm -hmm. of putting together a magazine, which is a group of editors. And uh, five people who worked on the staff uh, all started the television show back in 2001 on public television. And we thought, everyone said, oh, that's going to be a disaster. None of you are very good. Um, <laughs> you're magazine people. <laughs> you're magazine people. You're editors. You don't belong mm -hmm. in front of the camera. But there's something about putting two people together on uh, uh, talking about mm -hmm. food that most food shows are one person performing. And of course, you have to be right. fabulous on camera to be able to do that. Sure. And they are performing. And they are performing. What we're really doing is arguing with each other, debating, 
pushing and pulling each other's buttons, which is kind of what happens. Anyone who's ever worked in a, a creative place knows that that's mm -hmm. what it is, goes on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And we've sort of captured that on our television show. And I think people like the sense that they really feel they get understand how the creative process works in terms of how we create our recipes or how we do a taste test or how we review equipment. Exactly. So uh, uh, mac and cheese seems simple, maybe not so. The secret is two cheeses. Um, most people will use, who are trying to make a gourmet mac and cheese, will use a really great cheese like a aged cheddar. Mm -hmm. The problem is aged cheddar doesn't melt very well. And so you end up with a grainy sauce and you spent all this time making a sort of gourmet version of mac and cheese and then the sauce is not as creamy as what you could get out of a box. The secret is to pair that cheddar with a little Monterey Jack and it melts together and the Monterey Jack is absolutely creamy and you end up with the great flavor of the cheddar but the creaminess of the Monterey Jack. Well, who knew? I and mean, Velveeta would be cheating. That would be cheating and it wouldn't taste very good. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. I'm not a Velveeta fan either, but once I was, once I was, I bet you were too. Um, uh, Yukon Gold, great potatoes for french fries, you say. You can do almost anything with Yukon Gold. I mean, they're sort of the in-between potato. You know, you've mm. got your red potatoes, which are meant for boiling, and you've got your russets, which are meant for baking. And the Yukon Gold, you can do anything mm. with. You can roast them, you can smash them, you can turn them into oven fries, french fries. They're really the, our favorite uh, potato. Smashed potatoes, but not necessarily mashed potatoes. Smashed. <laughs> it is a combination. Not drunk potatoes, <laughs> just smashed potatoes. It is the best of both worlds. You get. Mm the interior that's creamy and fluffy like a mashed potato, but the exterior is crispy like a roasted potato. And what you do is you take mm -hmm. the potatoes, put them on the baking sheet with a little bit of water, cover them so that they get a little, and put them in the oven and they steam a little bit. But then you take the foil off and you smash them. And it's literally, you take another baking sheet and press them onto the potatoes. And so you get these beautiful discs, all crispy around the edge, and the inside is just mm -hmm. absolutely tender and fluffy. And it's fun doing the smash. It is. My kids that like part. to do the smash. Isn't it? Yeah, it's like hitting the moles at the uh, PNE or at the exhibitions when you have to whack a mole. Yes. Instead, you get to smash the potato, and they're delicious, really. Uh, what about this uh, vodka in the um, pastry? In the pie pastry, really? You add a little vodka? You do. It is the secret. And if you like to make your own pie, you have to try this recipe. Mm. The real problem with pie dough is that if you add too much water, you get gluten forming when the water mixes with the flour and you okay. end up with a tough crust. So most recipes short change the water, which means they're nearly impossible to roll out and they're, they're difficult to get to work with. So what we did is how could we get a dough that was easier to roll out, moist, but that didn't have a lot of water in it? And we're like, the light, you know, the right. light bulb went off. Mm -hmm. Well, what's wet that will not form gluten when it's mixed with flour? Alcohol. And so right. we add, replace the, a lot of the water with vodka so the dough is very easy to work with, but then that alcohol does not form gluten and the thing that gives baked goods their structure and can make them tough, and it burns off in the oven. You cannot taste the vodka, and it is just absolute sort of genius science brought to the real life in the kitchen. Who knew? Well, and uh, I'm sure if you use gin or bourbon, you could taste it. You, or could you? Probably could. You would taste be able to a little taste, juniper or You'd something. be able to taste a little bit of it. And that, you know, we chose vodka mm -hmm. for just that reason, that uh, the alcohol is going to burn off and there won't be any mm -hmm. residual flavor left because there was none to begin with. So many of the recipes in this tome are, are pretty simple, like uh, rice. We want people to cook. The number mm -hmm. one mission at Cooks Illustrated is to get people in their kitchens and making their own food. Because people ask me all the time, you know, how oh, I want to be healthier, I want to, I want to cook, and it's like, just do it. You know, it's not mm -hmm. as hard as people think it is. Sure, well, especially if you can do it uh, fairly quickly and you can visit with your guests and entertain. Uh, uh, risotto, risotto. Risotto. That's what I say. Uh, there's a fast way to make risotto. If you use a Dutch oven, which is a, you know, enameled cast mm -hmm. iron we love, holds mm -hmm. its heat really well, and flood the rice with most of the liquid, and then put the lid on and turn the heat down. You can let the agitation of the bubbles will sort of take the place of the stirring. And you can let it go for about 20 minutes. 
Then you take the cover off and you stir and add liquid for the last three minutes, but you've eliminated, rather than stirring for 25 minutes constantly, you're stirring for three minutes at the end, and you're letting a cover, low heat, and the bubbling liquid take the really? place of the stirring. So you saute it a little bit before you start, or do you bother? No, you do. You saute the onion, you'll put the rice in, saute that mm -hmm. for a couple minutes, add the wine, but at that point where you start adding the stock, usually mm -hmm. you're adding half a cup stir, at a time. Stir, add. And that goes on for about 25 minutes, and basically it's still 25 minutes, but you're only stirring for three at right. the very end. I like that. And does it cream up like good risotto should? It's totally you use creamy. The uh, right rice, arborio, what kind of rice? You have to use arborio, it has the right starch. Mm -hmm. You have to stir it at the end. That's If you don't stir it at the end, you don't get enough creaminess. You have to add a little butter and a lot of cheese at the end, which also helped create that velvety sauce. And it is really a lot less work and so that you can actually make something else. I mean, mm -hmm. the problem with risotto is you're tied to the stove mm -hmm. by the traditional method. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Sicily a, a few years ago and they have what's called caponata. It's a caponata. I think it's caponata. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, it can be kind of greasy because it's got eggplant in it. Right. It's the eggplant relish with tomatoes, raisins, raisins pine nuts, vinegar. Pine nuts. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. The problem with eggplant, whether you're making that or a pasta sauce or eggplant uh, parmigiana, is that it is a sponge. It will soak up all the oil you give it and it turns the dish greasy. What you need to do is use the microwave to microwave the eggplant with some salt and we do it on coffee filters. And basically what you're doing is you're drawing all the moisture out of the eggplant, collapsing the cell walls so that they will not soak up oil. And then you can saute mm. it, you can bake it, whatever do it is. Do whatever. So you leach out the liquid, I guess. Is yes. that what and, happens? And the old fashioned, my grandmother, my Italian grandmother would mm -hmm. salt microwave, uh, salt eggplant, but it would take an hour. And it would never be as effective as combining the salting with the microwaving, you are getting all of the liquid out of okay. the, the eggplant in and five minutes. And if you minutes. don't have a microwave, you have to go back to what your granny did. Exactly. Uh, uh, Pan-seared scallops, you butter-based. I was reading this the other day you, in the tome. You butter-based pan-seared scallops, which means... Well, when you go to a restaurant, you have that great browned crust yes. on a scallop. I and know. you're thinking, how do I do that at home? Mm -hmm. And first of all, they've got those great stoves that most people in their homes that don't too. have. <laughs> um, second of all, they're using big scallops, and that you really can do. You can go, the bigger they are, the longer they can spend mm -hmm. in the pan, so the browner they're going to get. But we said, how can we get even more browning? And so we are using butter and basting with the butter, and the, the milk solids in the butter brown and caramelize and sort of mm. jump start uh, that browning process, and it is a great so way to cook Julia scallops. Julia Child was right. It's a little bit of butter. Just a little bit of bucket. Shh. Now, thanks for making the banana bread. Did you whip that up this morning? In my hotel room. Good for you. What's in that? Lots of bananas, I bet. There are six bananas in this banana bread, and our goal here was to get an absolute ultimate banana bread mm. with big banana flavor, but the problem mm. is there's all that liquid in the bananas. So mm. what do you think we did to get rid of the, of the liquid? You salted them. I don't know. What did you do? We used a microwave. And so if you use a microwave, you can cook the bananas oh. and get all of the liquid out of them. Right. We then reduce the liquid on the stovetop. So we take three quarters of a cup of banana juice, reduce it down to a quarter cup, and you get this intense banana flavor without mm. it, the loaf falling apart. Oh, great. We shingled one that we caramelized on the top. You notice these pretty yeah, slices here with a little bit mm -hmm. of sugar sprinkled on top of them. And this is six bananas into so one So the mavo flavor would be really intense. And your marinara sauce in here, yum. It's easy to do. Sorry to make the segue so quick, Lee, but we have to go now. So, and I wanted to talk about marinara, so you'll have to come back from the Boston one of these days. But you will be at Barbara Joe's tonight, right? I will be. At 6 p.m. Will you be cooking or talking? Uh, I'm going to be doing both. Doing both. Great. How nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, Cook's Illustrated Cookbook, 2,000 recipes from 20 years of America's most trusted food magazine. No ads.